So clearly, it can be taught. Debíamos partir, que a la ley nuestro destino. Miren, chicos, esto lo pueden hacer ustedes. A mí me encanta que los libros empiecen justo desde la portada. Tiene como un puntito, está como diciendo, medio gritando. Llegué ayer por la mañana a Buenos Aires, ciudad a la que he viajado para permitir que la ficción, una vez más, se infiltre en mi biografía. Ir a la deriva, perderse. La pregunta es, ¿podemos vivir sin verdades? Hola, bienvenidos y bienvenidas. Buenas noches. Bienvenidos a este Festival Filba 2020, un festival que va a ser virtual, 100% online, toda su programación. Un festival que tuvo que transformarse hace seis meses en medio de la incertidumbre. Tuvimos que tomar la decisión de pasar a la virtualidad. Y en esa transformación crecimos y tuvimos que unirnos. El tradicional Festival Filba Internacional de Literatura se unió con el Festival Filbita, dedicado a la literatura infantil y juvenil. Esa transformación fue natural porque ese es el modo en que tenemos de entender la literatura. La literatura más allá de la edad de los lectores a la cual se dirige cada libro. Entendemos que el acceso a los libros es un derecho que nos constituye, constituye nuestra identidad y es un derecho al que tenemos que tener acceso desde los primeros meses de vida. Este año entonces festejamos y tendremos espacio también para festejar los 10 años de Filbita, un festival que en esta década se volvió central en la región para situar a la literatura infantil y juvenil. La transformación es el tema que nos atravesó a todos como humanidad y es el tema que va a atravesar estos nueve días de festival. Creemos que la literatura es una transformación. Existe como una explosión de realidades que están faltando. Realidades imposibles, perdidas, ocultas o inventadas. Realidades de la razón o realidades del delirio. La idea de realidad es la invención más fantástica de la mente humana, dice Mircha Cartarescu, uno de los invitados de lujos de este año, en Solenoide, su obra más monumental. Y si la realidad es una invención de cepa fantástica, ¿por qué la literatura no habría de hacer su realidad concreta? la realidad que queremos para cada uno de nosotros, para vivir nuestra vida. Lo que transforma la literatura es la supuesta dureza del mundo material en realidades múltiples y simultáneas, siempre parciales. El mundo es más grande con la literatura. Sin la literatura no podríamos transformarlo y quizás tampoco podríamos tenerlo. Durante nueve días tendremos realidades expandidas a través de más de 150 escritores, escritoras y artistas locales y extranjeros. Tenemos la lista de invitados que siempre quisimos tener, nuestra wish list hecha realidad. 
Hace pocos días revisábamos correos viejos buscando el primer mail que le mandamos al asistente de Joyce Carol Oates. La fecha dice 12 y cuarto del mediodía del miércoles 27 de enero de 2010. Si algo tenemos en Filba es perseverancia y 10 años después Joyce Carol Oates es la encargada de las palabras de apertura de este festival. Novelista, cuentista, crítica y dramaturga neoyorquina, autora de Memorias de una viuda, Persecución, La hija del sepulturero, Mujer de barro, Rey de picas, un libro de mártires americanos, entre otros 100 títulos, Joyce Carol Oates es una de las voces más inquietantes y poderosas de la literatura estadounidense del último medio siglo y también es una de las escritoras que más admiramos. Agradecemos a Museo Malva, con quienes venimos trabajando desde 2008, desde nuestro primer festival, ininterrumpidamente, y especialmente a Malva Literatura, coorganizadores de esta inauguración. Y también gracias a Mecenazgo de la Ciudad de Buenos Aires, a Fundación Williams, a Fundación Jan Michalski, a Eterna Cadencia, a las embajadas, a las editoriales, y sobre todo a los escritores y escritoras que sin saber mucho a qué se estaban sumando, sin saber qué iba a ser este festival y sin saber qué iba a ser de nosotros, en este tiempo presente nos dijeron que sí. Y gracias especialmente a Joyce Carol Oates, sobre todo por la paciencia ante nuestra insistencia en estos últimos 10 años y por sumarse esta noche a la historia de Filba. La escuchamos. Gracias. Hi, Filba Festival. I'm Joyce Carol Oates. Happy to be here. And uh, your theme of change and transformation is just brilliant. Well, literature is, is an expression of the human spirit that's been codified and formalized. And so I would guess it has its origins in oral culture, in, in people thinking and wondering about the, the stars, the nature of life and probably attributing to the origin of, of existence some sort of God or, or creator. And so I would, I would guess that literature evolves out of that oral tradition and it evolves out of a, wonder, a wonderment about the world that is very natural. But when we come to what you might call formalized literature, it's a culture that becomes historically established so that there is like a, a written language and then we may have books that are published and all this is a, a slow evolution. And, and essentially we are, one, we are wondering, we're in a state of mystery about the nature of our ex existence. And literature is the formalized expression of that wonderment that begins in the, the very early stages of a civilization, even before there is, a, before there's literature. You know, because we're, we're relatively, you know, we're relatively developed as a civilization. So we not only have books, libraries and books, but now we have the electronic revolution and so we have immense storage of information digital information that's available for everyone so this long rec recording of our history and our fascination with our origins now is established in a very objective way but as i said i think it begins just with people talking and telling stories before there was anything like a, a printed culture Well, the role of imagination, I think, is very essential, of course, to any kind of creativity, not just in literature and art, but in, in science and mathematics and, and, and music and any endeavor out of human spirit. The imagination is the, the fuel, the energy. It's like the sunshine, you know. It, it takes its form in many different ways. We can, we can imagine other people, we imagine other personalities, we can even imagine other worlds, or we can look upon this world as a mystery, as I think scientists do. Most people, when they look upon the world, I think they just accept it as what it is, but a scientist or perhaps an artist looks upon the world and wonders, how did we get here? And what are the causes? And where, where are we going? Those are all questions of the imagination. Well, 
I think I think the artistic expression of the human spirit has always been transforming people, but also expressing the transformation. The um, paintings, for instance, are give, giving an embodiment of something that's in someone's mind becomes a painting that one can see. So by looking upon it, one enters into the imagination of the, of the artist. The, um, the role of literature began with this, these questions about the universe, passes through, I think, a, an element of religious uh, fervor. There's a sense that re religion is not supposed to be mythological or metaphorical. People who are religious don't think that they're speaking about something metaphorical when they talk about God, but it might be considered that is a, 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 another expression of the human imagination is creating gods and deities and, and religions and this sense of giving meaning. All, all these things, I think, can definitely change people, particularly individuals. Literature, art, and music, and, and poetry tend to work on individuals rather than large crowds. If you want to change a large group of people, you probably need something very direct. Today, we would say television, speeches of politicians that are televised, or advertisements that try to change people's behavior in a consumer culture. But art tends to work on people as individuals. So if, for instance, you're a poet, you can expect your audience to be relatively small, but, but people can be very, very powerfully moved by, say, the poetry of, of Neruda, the, the work of uh, Cavafy, the work of, of course, Shakespeare and Tolstoy and Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman, all these individuals are so special and unique and they work upon individuals rather than large groups of people. The one book that changed my life completely was, was Alice in Wonderland and Alice in the Looking Glass because it was my first book my grandmother gave me when I was eight or nine years old. I was just a little girl growing up on a farm and my grandmother, my father's mother, gave me this book, a large book, Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass. So I was able to read and I was totally, totally um, taken to another world. So different from my life on the farm and so wonderful. I totally devoured that book many times. I, I memorized it without meaning to memorize it. I could recite the poems. I was fascinated. And then I tried to write my, my own little book with drawings and uh, in imitation of Alice in Wonderland. So that was the first real book of my life. And I think the lesson of Alice is that the imagination is overwhelming. You know, uh, Lewis Carroll was wonderful, very funny, but also very dark. And Alice is only seven years old in the, in the books, but she's very skeptical of adults. And she looks at adults and she thinks, I don't believe, I don't believe that, you know? And so it was an astonishing portrait of a child in contrast to adults, strong, a strong little girl uh, at the age of eight or nine, I had never met any children who could, who could be skeptical about adults. I had never met any child like Alice. And so reading about Alice in Wonderland was just amazing to me. Well, when I was in, when I was in high school, probably about 14 or 15 years old, I discovered Hemingway. And I read the early stories by Ernest Hemingway, which are quite different from his later work and different from his famous novels. The short stories of Ernest Hemingway, which he wrote when he was in his 20s, I found very transforming. So when I was 14 and 15 years old, I was very influenced and overwhelmed by the style of Hemingway. Not so much his subject matter, which was about a boy named Nick Adams, but rather the style, the language, the, the narrative skill, the minimalism of of Hemingway was very important to me.
Sometimes I think that loneliness gives rise to literature. Sometimes I think that loneliness can be an uh, impediment. Well, so there are times in our lives when we do find ourselves alone, and not always, uh, loneliness does not always come with being alone. You can sometimes be alone in a large family. You can be alone in a marriage if it's not going well. So it's not a, not a really matter of literally being alone, but to be a good writer or artist, you do have to spend much time in solitude. If you're in a busy, bustling family and you also have a job, you have to find some time where you go in your study and close the door. Emily Dickinson spoke of closing the door and locking it behind herself at the end of the day. She didn't have any privacy all day long in her family. But at night, when she went to her room to go to bed, she had a, a little desk and she would work on her poetry probably at midnight. Well, I think any kind of art begins with daydreaming. You may have a little dream at night. You wake up in the morning and you're in a state of wonderment. To me, literature and art begin out of a state of mystery. You wonder, why did that happen the way it did? And who is that person? I'm, if you meet someone who makes a, a, a strong impression upon you, you may feel that the person is a figure of mystery and you want to understand that person. I do believe that much of uh, War and Peace, for instance, for Tolstoy was generated by his great obsession with Napoleon, his wonder at Napoleon, his examination of Napoleon as a, as a great general, and then his wish to, to criticize Napoleon. If, if Napoleon had not been a um, great obsession for Tolstoy, he would not have written War and Peace. And I think all writers are dominated by some obsession, some haunted event in their lives. For many people, if they live through a war, the experience of war, they will come back and they will want to, to write about that because it's so overwhelming. Uh, if love is uh, disappointing or disastrous, many um, women especially will want to write about a marriage that went wrong, a love that went wrong and had seemed so perfect and good and then something happened. Uh, again, that's the element of mystery. That's a very complex question. It's, it's a little difficult to answer because we are in very different cultures and I, <laughs> I'm sort of overwhelmed by the, by the question. W women in my country, since the 1960s have been very conscientiously writing about feminist issues and um, also gay women, lesbians, have been defining their own um, ethos, their own mythology, a, a little bit separate from, from mainstream feminism, but um, connected. And that all women, I think, have been concerned with violence against women and girls. I began writing on that subject when I was quite young in my 20s. So this is a long time ago, maybe the 1960s and 1970s. I have written often about girls, 14, 15, 16 years old, and dealing with a world, a potentially violent world, a violent against women and how it's necessary for women and girls to be unified. There, there must be a sisterhood. Isolated people are victims, but people who join with others are much stronger. I have a novel called Foxfire, Confessions of a Girl Gang, a high school girls who band together in a, in a gang to make themselves strong because they've been victimized by boys and even by adult men. That novel, um, that novel was popular with some, in some feminist circles. I even met a woman who had a tattoo. I have met people with tattoos from Foxfire 
because it, it meant something to them. So the idea would be that literature teaches us that we need other people. We need other women and girls. We have a bond and a sisterhood. We should not be alone and isolated. We should not blame victims. We should try to understand and, and help them. And feminist literature definitely promulgates that. I have a novel called A Book of American Martyrs that ends with two young women who have come a very long way in different, different cultures. They are embracing, they are hugging because they have both suffered a great deal. And that the last line of the novel is they did not ever want to step away. You know? So the metaphor is that we need one another. Well, many, many things have changed in our culture in, in the United States. I think the most profound change maybe has to do with feminism. The, the rise of, of ethnic identity. So we have a culture, uh, a, black, a black culture, African-American literature, African-American culture, very important in the um, second half of the 20th century. Writers like Toni Morrison, who went, on, who went on to win a Nobel Prize, calling attention to the racial element the, uh, and racism in the United States. And we have the, the gay and lesbian movement, which is also of the late 20th century, establishing a, a completely new literature and like an independent uh, culture of their own. And then ethnic identities like chi Chinese American writers, uh, Amy Tan, for instance, uh, Indian American writers, Jhumpa Lahiri, and many others. And all these are all mixed together because America is a, such a diverse culture. You go into a bookstore and you see all these diverse uh, overlaps of, of genre, the mystery genre and how-to books memoirs, memoirs by women, memoirs by men. Uh, the, the literature is very rich and diverse. But all this belongs really to the second half of the 20th century. Before that, you would not have women's literature. There was no feminist literature, no gay or lesbian literature. In a bookstore, it would just be like, you know, literature, fiction. It would be mostly white men. I don't know that it changed my career because I came, I came along at a time when the white male writer or artist was the mainstream. But there were some women who were around the edges, um, like Eudora Welty or Flannery O'Connor, Edith Wharton, Emily Dickinson, Elizabeth Bishop. Uh, and in, in England, I mean, wonderful writers in, in England. Wonderful writers from the very beginning, like Jane Austen, was always acknowledged to be a very great writer. George Eliot was acknowledged in her time to be a great writer. Charlotte Bronte and Emily Bronte. In, liter in England, had been more of a history of strong women. In America, in the, in the 19th century, for instance, there may have been st some strong women writers, but they don't. But not like not like in England. And then in the 20th century. There have been strong women writers, but as I said, the white male writer was always the mainstream. A Will, when Willa Cather first began writing, she wrote under the name Will. She's a sort of a transitional figure. She was a woman, of course. She was a woman, but she was also a lesbian, and she wasn't so concerned with women's novels. She would write about issues that, that pertain to male subjects as well. So Willa Cather is a kind of transitional figure. Though she was a woman writer, she was allowed, in a sense, she was allowed into the mainstream. She was also an excellent, excellent writer. The experience of the pandemic in the United States has been very uneven. Uh, there are some regions of this country that actually have not been touched, hardly been touched at all especially very uh, rural areas that are not in the in near, near cities. The large urban areas of the United States have been very hard hit. So which we're speaking about United States, enormous large country with many regions. And then e economically, 
your economic level is very, um, de helps to determine how you experience the pandemic. People who are forced to live in small uh, places where they are overcrowded, people who live in urban areas where there are many, many people are, are much more likely to be infected. People who live out in the country, if you live in a house with your own, with a partner or live alone, you can quarantine much more, obviously. It has to do with money, how much money people have too. That's been such a scandal in this country that the poor, the more poor people who must go out and they must work, those are the people most hardest hit by the pandemic. My experience was I went into quarantine in March. I was teaching at the Princeton University and we went into quarantine. So I just went home and continued to teach my students with Zoom. So I, all, all my colleagues continued teaching remotely. So we were still teaching. We did not lose our jobs. And my students went home. All the students went home. They went home around March 11th. And I think most of them are still home. So we are continuing our work. I'm teaching this year. I have two classes, one at NYU and one at Princeton. So I meet my classes with Zoom. And we continue. We're writing. We're reading. We're discussing. In some cases, it's not so different from the class. If there are 10 or 15 students, we look at each other on the screen and we talk to each other. So it's not profoundly different. Now with other people, they have lost their jobs. They don't have enough money. They must go out to work in some menial way. And so that experience is like a catastrophe. When I've been writing, my work in my writing and my desk are not changed. I had always been a person who spent a lot of time alone, and now I spent more time alone. I don't think there'll be a change in humanity after the pandemic. There wasn't a change in humanity after the uh, great uh, influenza of 19. 1918, I don't think people changed. I think that science will, science will learn. Scientists have learned, are focusing on infectious diseases and epidemics. Um, we will learn from that. But unfortunately, nations are governed by politicians. And sometimes politicians are anti-science. So it would not really matter. If we had another very ignorant president, President Trump is extremely ignorant of science. He's contemptuous of science. If you have a leader who is ignorant of science and anti-science, it won't really matter too much. But if you have a leader who's intelligent and has uh, advisors who will follow scientific directives, definitely. The um, pandemic in the United States could have been uh, just a fraction of its severity. Many, many, many fewer people would have died if we had had a different president. For instance, if Hillary Clinton had been president or Obama, they would have surrounded themselves with scientists and advisors who, who knew how to deal with epidemics. Because we had Trump as a president, he had surrounded himself with anti-science advisors. And so we had a very bad, uh, bad luck in the United States. It was just bad luck. So I don't think that will necessarily happen in another country or maybe not in this country again. So I would be optimistic that we can learn from our mistakes. Because we're in a democracy in, in the United States, we, um, we're in a situation where there are maybe many millions of people who, who vote who have received misinformation, especially from social media. So it's, a, it's a, a development maybe of the 21st century that social media can send out to, de, in a democracy, can send out to citizens and voters misinformation. So it's like anti 
education. And democracies depend upon people being educated and getting correct information. But now in the 21st century, that's become an issue because many people are, are brainwashed and they actually have the wrong they have the wrong information. How that will work out, I have no idea. It's beyond it's beyond the the role of a novelist to deal with that. Well, I think like all writers, I really love language. It gives me great happiness when I read something that's well written. For instance, I've mentioned that I'm teaching at Princeton. I'm also teaching at NYU. And I get writing from my students and sometimes it's so good. I just feel happiness. Or I might be reading a, a, a magazine and like the New Yorker and I might read a poem. I might read a short story by somebody I've never heard of. And it gives me great happiness to read something exciting and new. And then with my own writing, I hope for the same experience. Sometimes I work very long on a page and then the next morning I read it over again and I think, you know, I think that's actually, it's somewhat good. And I feel a spark of hope and excitement. And so I think that we are all led for to these moments of surprise and happiness it could be a sentence, it could be some dialogue, it could be a character, it could be a story, a surprise ending. It could be just a thrill of something profound. It could be tragedy. There are works by Kafka that are very profound and tragic and yet very beautiful. Well, I've been thinking about the theme of change and transfiguration. And I think that our lives are a process of continued change and transfiguration, not just one, but many times. You know, when you're, when you're a child, at some point, you become an adolescent. You sort of move to a new stage. And literature is always reflecting that. We have a strong young adult literature in the United States written for children who are becoming uh, adolescent. You know, we have... a young adult literature for slightly older teenagers. And then there's the literature of people who are in their 20s, who are going into the world to get married, to take up their jobs, and there's a strong uh, portraits of these people. And then later on, having children, having families, you'll find a literature about that. And then the experience of being a widow or widower the many memoirs on that subject. So change and transfiguration is the very skeleton, like the backbone of all literature. This poem appeared in the, in the New Yorker a couple of years ago, in hemp woven hammocks reading the nation. This is the season when the husbands lie in their hemp woven hammocks for the last time, reading the nation in waning autumn light before dusk rises from the earth, before the not knowing if ever again the earth will turn on its axis to the light, the great furnace of the light, will it return the husbands to the light in their hemp woven hammocks reading the nation? <laughs> Is that okay? Would you like anything more? Kitty says goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>